The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Can everybody hear me? Okay, that's great. We're all good to go? I get a thumbs up. Hi, welcome. Uh, hope you're enjoying Southeast Linux Fest. This is actually my first time here, so hopefully most of you are more uh, alumni and can show me the ropes during the day. My name's Ronald Bradford, and as I just mentioned earlier, um, I'm gonna be giving a talk on Explain today uh, in lieu of our uh, previous presenter who, um, due to unfortunate circumstances, is not here. And I know his talk was going to talk more about the MySQL 5.6 features of Explain, so I'll touch on those as well. However, the purpose of this presentation is more about explaining how to use the MySQL Explain. Uh, how many people here actually use MySQL more than nothing? Okay, good. And hopefully some of you have actually looked at Explain, tried to work out how to use it in terms of improving the performance of query. So I'm gonna go through today how to read and how to use this tool so that you can work on improving performance in, in your systems. So I'm going to go through and I'm gonna describe some of the options and the syntax that's possible with this command. I'm gonna go through the attributes that you see as the result uh, of the explain command. And then I'm gonna talk about how you can read and interpret those results. Uh, known as the Query Execution Plan, or QEP. And at the same point in time, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the limitations uh, that this command has, particularly if you're comparing it with a different database product, a Postgres or an Oracle, etc. So, this is what Explain can do. It can tell you what the optimizer intends to do with the query that you're about to execute. There isn't an absolute guarantee that this is what it will do, but it's generally the case. So when you see the explain plan, you can look at that. The explain plan, if you reverse engineer it, helps you determine how the MySQL optimizer works. The optimizer is a very complex piece of code, which given an SQL statement, goes through all the possible paths of the types of options it could use with the data it has to retrieve, the indexes that are available, the conditions that you've set to try and work out the best way to give you the result in the shortest period of time. Now, if the optimizer chooses a different path, it doesn't mean the results are going to be different. What it does mean is, is that it may take longer to execute. And in you know, any particular application, you want SQL to run as efficiently as possible so that your users are happy with the result. The purpose of this presentation is not to help you to improve your SQL statements. The purpose of this presentation is to give you all the tools and the information so that you can interpret that properly with other types of data and then make informed decisions about making improvements. So um, just the slide about myself, I'm not gonna spend much detail on it. I've been working with MySQL for quite some time now. Uh, I'm recognized as the all-time top blogger in MySQL. I've written a few books. Uh, I've actually worked for MySQL Link, the company, and, and while I don't work for MySQL or Oracle now, uh, I'm very um, open in the community, so you know, I wear this uh, as a badge to represent MySQL the community as a company, not in terms of any official relationships. And um, I live here in the US and I do independent consulting in MySQL, that's what my day job actually is. Um, this presentation is going to talk about um, how to optimize statements. And some of the things that I'll talk about you can actually find in one of my previous books on optimizing SQL statements. So that's there for reference as well. So just some background about the MySQL optimizer. Uh, it's a cost-based optimizer. So it's going to make a decision based on how much it, it expects, expects it will cost the query to execute. And basically that comes down to how much disk I are you going to do. There are some other indicators, but effectively cost means how expensive is it going to be for me to retrieve the information from disk. In MySQL, there is no way for you to pin a query execution plan. 
What that means is, is that every time an SQL statement runs, it will calculate a new query execution plan for every statement. If you run a thousand statements that are the same every single second, it will do it a thousand times. MySQL has no way to keep a copy of what should be executed. MySQL provides some hints that enables you to sort of like inform the optimizer of certain things you might want to do. In other database products, particularly Oracle, there are a large number of hints where between different versions you can say, I really want you to do it this way or I really want you to do it this way. And as I mentioned, it's calculated every time. The only exception is in MySQL, if you rerun a statement and the results have been put into the MySQL's query cache, which is a very optimized way to retrieve data from a query very quickly that's been executed multiple times, that information is already predefined in network packets, so it doesn't actually have to go through the plan. There are three types of syntax for the explain command. There's the traditional explain select statement. And then there are two extended attributes for this, explain permission, uh, uh, partitions and explain extended. And I'm going to go through each one of these at a later time. Now, when I wrote these slides originally and when I actually published the book on uh, optimizing SQL statements, which includes a lot of detail about explain, it was only possible to do an explain statement on a select statement. Now, what's quite important is, is that in your system, inserts are generally quite efficient, but update statements and delete statements can actually take a long time to execute. And you should also, you should always look at uh, running an explain plan on those to determine if they're efficient or not. And historically, you had to rewrite the SQL statement as a select. Now, one of the features in MySQL 5.6 is that you can now run explain on insert update and delete. This is important because on an update you want to know that if you're not doing any work with the primary key that you're using an index, for example, the most efficient way to access your data. So that's a 5.6 feature which is uh, very good to know. This presentation is about describing explain. This is just one of the commands that you as a developer or a DBA will use in terms of gathering information to make a better decision about improving your SQL statements. I'm not going to go into much detail, but these are some of the other commands that you really need to know about so that you can like, take all the information available and make a good decision. Show create table is going to give you the full DDL definition of the table. It's going to list all the columns, the column data types, nullability, it's going to list the primary key and the indexes. These are all important things that you need to know when you're reading a query execution plan. The show indexes command lists the indexes that are on a given table and it has one particular column which is of value which is known as cardinality. And this is an indication of the statistics that are available to you to determine how unique the value is in the individual columns in an index. So a higher number shows a much more uniqueness. Generally a primary key uh, will show you the total amount of uniqueness because every row is actually unique. And then columns that are indexed that have a very low cardinality means that many rows will be matched when you use that value. And so that may not be an effective index. The show table status command provides additional information about the storage engine that's used, the version of the storage engine, and it also shows the size of the table. This is important if you want to modify the table, to alter the table, to change the indexes. Because under normal circumstances, this is what's known as a blocking operation. And it will take time to execute. And if you're unfamiliar with the size of the table, this can really cause problems with your application. MySQL also has an ANSI standard information schema. This is a set of tables that give you meta information. All the data that you can get from the show commands, you can also retrieve from an SQL statement using information schema. And show variables and show status shows the actual session and global variables that MySQL has configured. Some of those are important for some types of queries. And show status gives you incremental counters of what's happening inside the database. So when you actually execute an SQL statement, you can use this to say, did I create a temporary table? How many rows did I actually read? How many pages did I read? 
And there is a new feature that, again, in terms of talking about the new 5.6 features, there are three of them. The first is, is that you can run and explain on more than an SQL a select state, which we talked about. The second is what's known as optimizer trace. And this is a great tool to expose what the optimizer actually does. Explain only gives you what it intends to do. Where optimizer trace actually goes through and shows you all the paths that the database considered to execute. If you have multiple table joins, it will show you those, all those joins so you can see what prune operations were done to determine the query it wanted to execute. It will also give you more information about the rows it's going to access, some better detail of the statistics that you have against the column. The show indexes command is the only other command that gives you an approximation of that. So now the optimizer trace is giving you better access. Still not as good as a histogram of all the information that you actually want, but a little bit better. And the third thing that uh, uh, is available in 5.6 is something I'll talk about in a second, actually. So in general rules, an explain statement will not actually run your query. It will actually go through the parsing and optimizing process to determine how it would run the query. There are some exceptions to this. When you're using certain types of correlated subqueries or derived tables uh, for MySQL statements, the optimizer may have to actually execute that in order to determine what the best path is to then determine the best path of the entire query. Now in 5.6, again, there have been improvements in these areas and only just on Tuesday at the MySQL Innovation Day in San Francisco where they're talking about some of the significant improvements here in terms of the um, explain improvements for these types of queries. So what do you do when you get an explain statement? What do you see? These are the two outputs that you would generally see. The new output, which I haven't got in my slides, is a 5.6 feature which provides this output in JSON format. So before 5.6, what you would see is these 10 attributes. And generally you'll see them in column format normal SQL statement. But in MySQL, there is also this nice little syntax called backslash uppercase G. And what it does, it provides the output in vertical format. Now, when you're looking at this and you're looking at an explain plan that has lots of rows, you're probably going to want to use the first format. But particularly for presentations and for book content and for scripting, uh, the vertical format is very handy to be able to extract information. So don't forget that that option actually exists. So what is in the explain? These are the 10 attributes that I'm going to talk about that go through uh, and give you information that you need to be able to interpret to be able to improve the queries that you're running. Now, if someone here in the room was not using MySQL or not familiar with MySQL or familiar with another relational database, and they knew the concept of explain, and they said, what's most important? If you wanted to look at what were the most important things, then there are two to look at. That's the key and the rows. If you see this, if you see that a key is being used, then that means an index for the particular row in the explain plan, and the explain plan has one row per table of your query. Now, a table may be an actual real table that you've done a join on, or it may be a derived table or, an, or, or a created table in terms of MySQL's processing. And if you see key, and if you see rows equals one, that's statistics saying that I'm going to use a key and I expect to find one row. This is basically the best that you can actually get when you want to retrieve data. Correspondingly, if your query showed you that it wasn't using a key and it showed a large number of rows, then effectively what you're doing is a full table scan of that table. Under normal operating procedures, that is usually a candidate for improvements. There are some special edge cases, particularly with very large data sets, where it's more efficient to scan the whole table. But generally speaking, if you see no key and you see a large number of rows, red flag to go, there's probably an improvement that can be made here to make that better. So this is not what you want to see, and this is what you want to see. Okay? We're all still with it. 
So the key attribute, as I mentioned, gives you the index name that's being used for that particular row. Now in general terms, you will only see one index used per table in an SQL query. Whether that is actually used for the where or the join, the order by or the group by, there's generally only one being used. There are a couple of exceptions to those and I'll show you one of those in a minute. But if you're designing your database and you're optimizing your SQL statements, you should stick with that rule. Now, two other attributes which I'm going to go through that are important when you're talking about the key. One is possible keys and one is the key length. So here's the example that we're talking about. Here's an example where two indexes were actually used. Introduced in MySQL 5.0, there were a couple of cases of, in, of where the optimizer could choose more than one index and merge them together to provide a quicker way to produce the results. And in this particular case, we have two indexes on the first name and the last name. And because we're doing a join on that query with an OR statement, the optimizer said, well, I've got two indexes that are roughly have the same cardinality, but I can actually join them together to give me a better result. Because if you had an index on first and last, or an index on last and first, it's not actually going to work because of the OR in your WHERE statement. So the optimizer can actually join those together. And there are a couple of other examples, the sort, uh, sort merges an example. Generally speaking, if you see that, you should determine if you can create a better index first. When these first came out in MySQL 5.0, some queries actually ran worse. I mentioned before that the optimizer will make a decision on which path to choose, and the results are going to be the same, but one query may be slower or faster. Your goal with the explain plan is to always get the fastest query, but early on, sometimes this actually made queries run slower. And it wasn't until 5.1 where you're able to actually disable these particular optimizer cases. And now you can choose if you want to turn this particular rule on or off at a global level. Now, keys tells you what was used. Possible keys tells you what the optimizer considered to use. These are part of the different types of uh, tree traversal that it's going through and the pruning that it's going to do to eliminate these indexes as less efficient to retrieve the data that you want. So if you see some possible index values and then you see no key value, then you can see that the optimizer made a choice that it decided it was better not to use an index. And sometimes you may have to ask the question why. Generally speaking, it's not good to have too many values here because remember the query goes through this process every single time. And if you have a large number of values, then MySQL has to make a lot of decisions to eliminate those. So here's an example where in the first query, we see that it had a choice to choose a key and it elected not to choose that key. Now there are various circumstances for that and that can be quite in-depth conversation. But in the second example, you can see where it, it looked at using the key and it actually used the key. So these are the things that you want to look out for uh, if you're running the same query. Here is an example where in this particular query there are a large number of indexes. This is a common problem if people are not familiar with how to design to work optimally with MySQL or they're using some ORM tool. Uh, some of those we'll, we'll, we'll leave as unnamed for this conversation. Those that use Ruby on Rails or Hypernate, not good. No, 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 if you have any questions, please. Which ones suck? Which ones suck? Just so we know that if we're using those tools to write code to get it done yes. quickly, then it would be worthwhile our time. I'm not, sure if I'm not sure in this presentation or a... So the question was, which ORMs are bad? And I'm not sure if it's in these slides or in a, or in a similar presentation that in my conclusion, I have a slide and basically it states, it states frameworks generally suck uh, as a global statement. All frameworks, without exception. So Ruby on Rails and Hibernate and Ibatis or any others that you can think of, um, I guess SQL Alchemy and these sort of things, Generally, they're designed to improve the development process. They are never database friendly. 
And this is a good, this is not an example of a um, ORM product, but when you see lots of single columns, in this case there are some, some multiple columns, which is, you know, someone's made an attempt to do it. There's actually a duplicate index in here, which is like an overhead that you should be avoiding. Um, so if you have like a table and you have like 10 single columns that are indexed, quite often no one's considered what really should be used. And because they go, you know, where column A equals this and column B equals this and column C equals this, they'll create an index on A and B and C separately, not, really, not realizing that the optimizer will generally choose just one index. And by combining them, you actually get a better index. So um, both normal design and ORMs can, can not help in this situation. Now I mentioned rows earlier. Rows tells you the approximate number of rows it expects to actually use when it executes the query. I say approximate because it's based on statistics which may not be completely accurate in the table. And also, you've got to realize that the statistics may not show a good distribution. If you have four or five values, but 90% of them are one value and 1% is another value, 1% is another value, the rows may not be a true indicator uh, as well as possible. So they're the basic things, but if you really want to understand, there are some more command, there are some more uh, attributes that really help. And this is one of the key attributes that as a consultant that I'm going to look at when I review your system. After making sure the schema is okay and the SQL statements are executing things appropriately and they can be cached between deterministic and non-deterministic, and I see that you're using indexes, what I'm going to do is see how effective your indexes are. And the key link tells me when I'm talking about a concatenated index or a, you know, a multi-column index where there's more than one column in the index, how efficient that index actually is. The key length will tell me how many bytes are actually being used in the index. And I have several examples to go through here because this is a, a good advanced topic to work with. There is no absolute answer as to what the number means. In fact, it can be a complicated calculation to work out what the number actually is. Here are the common things you should look at. Different data types for columns will have different values. And then the difference between a character and a varchar field, a null field, all add different bytes to this. And when you choose different character sets, they will also change the value of the key length column. So here's an example of an explain plan. And I can look in the explain plan before I even look at the table. I can see I'm using a primary key. I can see I'm using one constant value and I can see the key length is eight bytes. So I can tell you with extreme confidence that you're using a big int data type, unless your column is char eight, which is unlikely. <clears throat> and I can also tell that generally when people use big int, they use it with auto increment. Now, the goal of this presentation is not to give you tips on how to improve your queries, but here's one tip to take away. When I see this in practically every case, big int is an over uh, statement for what you need to do. The int data type is actually four bytes long and big int is eight bytes long. Now an int unsigned column can store a value to 4.3 billion. So if you're inserting rows into a table and you're getting a new column, if you hit 4.3 billion you generally have a different problem that you need to solve. So int is more than sufficient than big int. Now what's even better is, is that people will use foreign keys and foreign keys will also be big int. You convert all of those from big int to int, you reduce the size of all your indexes by 50%. That means less index space on disk, more stuff available in memory. That one change alone can make a big difference in performance. Varchar is a variable character length on disk. Varchar is not a variable character length in the memory inside MySQL when it's used. So for all those people that go uh, Varchar 255 is okay or Ruby on Rails say that Varchar 255 is okay, it is if you're only storing a few bytes on disk, but if you use that information in memory in some type of operation, MySQL will expand it to be fixed width. So this is another one to consider when you have a limited amount of memory and you have thousands of connections to be able to improve 
your uh, definition of the table. So we can see 32 bytes, which we can refer to as being varchar 30 and two extra bytes for the actual length of the column. Now, if you use the default character set of Latin 1, it's going to be 32. If you use UTF-8, then MySQL is going to continue to expand that so it's fixed width. So now you'll see 92 for the same table definition and the same index, but because it's using a UTF character set, it's actually going to be using more memory. Here is an example from the popular WordPress tool. I'm sure some of you have probably heard of that before. And here's one of the indexes in WordPress where it has four columns. And I've given you down here the byte length of each column so we can work out how long it actually is if we were to use the entire index. And here's an explain plan where a query's been executed and it's looking for particular posts. And we can see it uses post type and post date, which are in the index, but the key length is only 62. It's not actually the total key length of the index. So I can tell by looking at the key length of the index of 62 and then looking at the index that the SQL statement is not using all of the columns in the index. It's only using the leftmost portion of columns. And even though the query is using column one and column three, in relational database theory, indexes move from the left to the right in terms of definition. So if the query had been written like this, where it included the second column, then you can see the key length is now 132 bytes. So it's using the first part of the index, the second part of the index, and the third part of the index to satisfy the query's needs. So this is the difference between the key length where I see 62, and if I looked at all of the SQL statements that were executed, this is only one, and it's important when you tune an SQL statement that you may be improving one query but not improving others. So you really need to look at all of the SQL statements in your application. But if all the SQL statements was just one query and it was 62 bytes, then I would say that these three columns are not needed and so that will actually take more disk space. It will actually slow down inserts, updates and deletes. So this is where the key length can come in handy. Now some of the other attributes that you may not look at in great detail but can help you in determining how the optimizer is working, one is select type. This will actually go through and tell you the type of operation that's actually happening. And these are the primary things that you'd see. Select a simple primary subquery derived union. What that means is it's a simple query. Uh, when you have multiple tables, the primary table that's generally used will be shown as primary and the rest will be shown as simple. Subquery, it's executing a subquery derived in union. There are some other data types which become uh, more descriptive as you look at different types of SQL statements. So in this example we can see a query that does a join between two tables. When I talked earlier about a line in the execution plan could be a physical table or a derived table and the first query you can see the first one is actually a primary table and the second line is referred to the derived table, a table that's generated on the fly. And the number in the uh, table along with the select type, so you can see that this means, you know, row two is a derived table, and the table over here is actually using the derived table from row two. Correspondingly, in the union statement, you can see even though, you know, we've got a query between one select statement, union, another select statement, MySQL has actually given you three lines of output, not two lines of output, because internally, it's creating another table to combine those results. So the select type can give you additional information if you're getting more lines than you would expect in terms of numbers of tables. Here is an example of the same query written three different ways. Now I mentioned to you that you could write a query and the query execution plan could produce different explain plans. Here's an example of a query that is looking between a master and a child table, and looking for all master records, all parents that have no children. And I've written it three different ways. The results are exactly the same, but the explain plan is different in all three. Which one is best? Any takers? No takers? The second one because it's two simple tables. 
Well, the correct answer is it depends. <laughs> it depends on many. <laughs> it depends on many factors, particularly the size of the data uh, that you have in question. However, you are correct, and um, uh, I have some copies of my book. So afterwards, you're welcome to a free copy of my book for saying that by looking at this, you would indicate the second query is actually the better one. And <clears throat> um, while the answer looks at two simples seem to be the way to look at it, it's actually the inverse. If you look at the other queries, we see dependent subquery. Now in MySQL, subqueries are not that performant. And so quite often it's better to actually rewrite your query so you don't use a subquery. There is an exception in that sometimes when you do not in queries, they can be very performant. So depending on the, uh, the query you're running, you know, you may find that a subquery is actually as good. But what's important is, is that even though you have written an SQL statement and then you've looked at the explain plan, there may be other ways in which you can actually write the SQL statement. I know I'm only talking about explain here, but it's an important thing to realize that if you can't get what's exactly right, maybe there's a better way to write the query. Just a little tip to take away to, to mess with your mind about, I thought I could just tune the SQL statements. The extra column, which is the last of the columns, is one of those things that's a bucket that fills everything. And so you get lots of information there, you get lots of values that can be combined, and some of them are good and some of them are not so good. Uh, and I'm gonna go through each one of these um, separately. So, first one is using temporary. What this means is that MySQL internally had to take the results of something that it was doing and create an internal temporary table. An internal temporary table is very much like MySQL's memory table. And you can actually have many temporary tables in a complicated query. So these are not always bad, sometimes they're needed. There are you know, 10 or 15 different types of operations where you just have to have a temporary table, you can't avoid it if you're ordering by different columns across tables or, or so forth. And this wiki page can give you the in-depth analysis if you really want to understand how the optimizer works of those. The issue of a temporary table is, is that sometimes a temporary table can't fit in memory for certain, certain reasons and is written to disk. And a created temporary table status variable is sometimes acceptable, but a created disk temporary table is an impact on your system. And when you see lots of those, when you see 20, 30, 60 a second, that's a lot of disk I.O. that may be able to be eliminated. There are two causes of why you have a created temporary table. First the first cause is the data that it's joining together is it's working with a text or a blob column. So all those ORM products out there, I have to keep bagging ORM now, you mentioned it, that just go, oh, I'm gonna create the column called text and text and text and not varchar. If internally my SQL has to join that data together or do any work, and it needs a temporary table, it will go, I can't actually do that in memory, I have to write it to disk, I have to read it back from disk. And automatically your query is 100 times slower. The other recurrence is, is that if you exceed the size of the table, which is the minimum of these two variables, then MySQL will go, it's too large. Now you can change those variables on a per SQL statement basis. So if one query is joining a lot of data together, you may say, just give it a little bit more memory. But combined with that show status command that I mentioned earlier, you can look at that in conjunction with running a query and you can see some of the internal things in addition to when it says using temporary. The explain plan won't tell you whether it's going to write it to disk or not. The status variables will tell you that. <coughs> using file sort, as the name describes, is I have to sort the data that I've been given into the order in which you want it, generally in order by statement. And this is generally okay. This is, you know, this is just part of life, but it can become CPU intensive if you're running hundreds and hundreds of queries per second that have to sort a certain amount of data. You can actually see the CPU load in the system go up. Sometimes that's not really that important these days because machines have so many cores, uh, you can afford to get away with that. There are two ways to improve a using file sort. One is to ask the question, do you need to sort the data? Maybe the data doesn't have to be sorted. Maybe the application or the client can actually sort it. Well, the other way is, can you use an index to sort the data? Now, I'll go back to the earlier rules. Generally, MySQL will use one index per table. And an index can be used in the where join qualifications, 
the order by and the group by. So it's going to choose one or the other. Here is an example of a query where oh, I gave you the answer. Uh, here's an example of a query where you can see that I'm joining two tables together. I can see that I'm using keys. So in this particular case, I'm using a primary key and the customer ID. And then from the, um, from the, the, the uh, table itself, I'm actually sorting the results of the data. Now, if only I improve my indexes, so what I've done is I've created a, a um, in this case, an index that has an additional column, but I'm able to leverage the index now both in the where clause and in the sorting. So I'm able to remove the using file sort. If you can do this, this is a big win. It can be a little bit complicated to do. It depends on how complicated your ordering is. But this is one way to actually eliminate file sorting. The benefit is, is that the data is sorted on disk when the rows are inserted and updated and deleted. MySQL's done it once and it doesn't have to bother about sorting the data every time. Now, I talked about the key attribute. And the key attribute tells you which index was going to be used by the query. Now, the extra column also has a value called using index. And you may go, well, why are you telling me you're using index because the key says you're using the index. What it really means is that I'm only using the index. Now, for those people that are not familiar with, this is what's known as a covering index. And I have an entire presentation of an hour that describes how you would find a situation where you could actually use a covering index. And I go through a single table join and a two table join and a 13 table join of how good this actually is. What this means is, is that when it's joining two tables together and it uses an index to work out what types of rows it wants in the join, it then does not have to go look at the data that matches those rows. The index itself satisfies all the information that you want for the query. Basically, if you see the words using index, that's about the best you can get if you're actually using an index. This is the way to go. Here is an example of a query that I work with a client and it ran 25,000 times per second across their servers. And they thought that they were running the query really well. They would tuned the query. They would created a key column on every table of the 13 table join. And they were convinced that they couldn't make the query run any better. And so it took 175 milliseconds to run. But it was being executed you know, many thousands of times per second. I simply took the query. I never changed the code. I didn't change the configuration. I just improved the indexes. This one tip of trying to create what's known as a covering index by adding additional columns to indexes so that MySQL didn't have to do join, didn't have to find the index values. I'm doing a join, I find 10 rows, and then I've got to do sequential lookups to look at the values of those 10 rows. 175 milliseconds, 5 milliseconds. Now you might go, that's OK, but remember, this is 175 milliseconds multiplied by 25,000. So huge win. So um, as I said, there's another presentation about this. So using index is something that if you really want to expand how to understand and optimize queries with indexes, doing that. I also want to point out that I'm explaining how to use the explain plan. And I'm talking about creating indexes and improving indexes. And I talked before about maybe rewriting queries may be efficient. It's important to realize that creating and, 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 and adding or changing indexes is not the only way to optimize an SQL query. And quite often, it's not the only way to do it, and it's not the best way. So again, we're talking about one particular case. But realize, in terms of larger design, there are often other ways to improve things. Here's one of those other extra values called using join buffer. What this means is, is that I have some data and I want to try and join to another table but I can't find a key to use. So you can see the other attributes I was telling you about. We can see the possible key there, but we could see the actual key used was null. So here's an indicator that it's doing a scan and joining data together, and there's a, a room for improvement with an index there. <coughs> there are some other less common types of values that you will see from time to time. Um, this is one of my uh, ones I like to see. It's quite a people, people go, what does that really mean? Select tables have been optimized away. 
um, you don't need the table anymore? Well, in this case, what happens is, is that the actual second table, which is a derived table, satisfies the results and it doesn't actually need the first table anymore. It's sort of like a using index value. I mentioned earlier that there are a couple of exceptions to that one index per table rule. You may see these particular syntaxes using sort join, sort union, union, intersect, that it's using more than one index per table. Now when I first, uh, these, these types of operations came out in MySQL 5.0, everyone would go, well now you can use two indexes. Uh, in, in, in a particular table. And it wasn't until I was actually writing the book about this that I was actually able to find an example where MySQL would actually join three indexes on one particular table. Now I can't say if that's going to be more efficient than not doing it, but, but the thing is, is that you can actually see uh, further complexity uh, in this particular merging of indexes. Now there are two other extensions to the explain command. There's the explain partitions command which will give you an extra attribute and lo and behold it's called partitions and it will describe the partitions that it's actually using for a partition table so no rocket science necessary there. The second example is explain extended. Now this produces an extra column called filtered which can help in terms of giving you a better estimate of the number of rows it's looking at. In reality I've rarely seen it not be a hundred and I don't find great value in actually looking at that particular information. However, explain extended does something very important in that it actually gives you a warning. And if you actually heed the advice and look at the warning, you will find that it will show you the rewrite of the SQL statement that the PARS and the optimizer undertook. Now this is not common practice you don't generally have to look at this and experienced DBAs sometimes don't even know about this. And here's an actual example where a, a colleague who was an experienced DBA said, I don't know what's wrong with this query. I've looked at the explain plan, I've looked at the show create table, I have 10 million rows here, I have 20 million rows here, I'm joining two primary keys, why is it not using the index? Because it would show that it looked at the index and it showed it discarded it. Explain extended can help show you what it rewrote the query to do. If you're using a view, for example, or other types of operations, you can see what's expanded. In here, what happened was the query was being written to actually do a scalar function to convert on the particular column. It was converting the column to UTF-8. And if you actually went back and looked at the table definition, one was defined as Latin 1, one was defined as UTF-8. And even though they were both columns to join together, MySQL couldn't handle it, so it had to convert one. It had to like do a conversion of the column. And because there's no scalar functions in MySQL indexes, it basically had to scan the entire table to convert the actual column to the right data type. So here's one of those examples where explain extended is sort of like a less commonly used syntax, but can provide a little bit of help when you, when, uh, you sort of wonder why the explain plan is not actually doing what it wants. I mentioned earlier there are some hints these are things that you can use to give the query optimizer a hint to say, I want you to do this. And there are certain types of uh, general hints on indexes. You can say, I I'd like you to use this index. I'd like you to ignore this index. Or I really, really want you to use this index. And as I mentioned before, you know, indexes are used in the join, order by, and group by. You can say, I want to use it in one particular type or the other. Um, there is another hint which sometimes becomes beneficial called straight join. When used with the select statement, this actually says the order of which I'm giving you the tables in the, in the actual query, that's the order I want you to process them in. So sometimes this can actually be helpful. There are some other ones that deal with caching, with uh, whether you want to cache the result in the query cache, whether you want to uh, buffer the information on the server before sending to the client, change the priority. There's also one called SQL calc found rows. And for some applications this is beneficial because people will do a select information from table, limit a certain number of rows, put those 20 rows on the page of your web page, but then have to run another query to work out how many rows are in the query so you can say this is page one of 10. And so you're running the query twice. You can actually use select SQL calc found rows 
to actually give you that number without having to actually run the full query. So I could say I'm getting 10 rows back, but then I can actually go, how many rows did I actually find? Now while this is good, you have to realize that sometimes the time it takes to do this was actually longer than running both queries. So I show you as the hint to go, this exists for people sometimes who don't know about it, but use with appropriate testing and verification. When you start running several hundreds of these per second, you'll find it's far less efficient than you think. So wrapping up, and I'm almost out of time, um, you have to know how to use explain. In this presentation, I've just gone through and given you an overview of what's important, how to read it, because how to read it will help you in determining how your system's working and how you can make improvements. It's not the only information you need. There are other commands and other values that we combine together. The table definition, how well the index cardinality is, maybe some of the statistics, the show status, all those things can help you interpret with the explain plan. Um, there are some other presentations that I have that are related to this topic, so if you want to understand a little bit more, there's an entire presentation just on the internals of indexes. Because in MySQL, there's generally what people know as a B tree index, and there's a hash index. Now, even if you know how a B tree index works in theory, in MySQL, there's a B tree index which works with a clustered key. There's a B tree index in a storage engine of MyISAM, and there's a B tree index in the storage engine of NODB, both for secondary indexes. Their implementation is different. The columns and the values that it uses are different, so understanding internally can help you improve things. And the other, in, other, career, other presentation I talked about, about, particularly about how to see the uh, using extra, uh, is beneficial as well. And I think that's all I had. So are there any questions that you would like to know about the MySQL explain plan? Yes? Yes. Um, that the question is, in explaining standard, does it actually show you uh, the change query? Uh, good question. Uh, I believe it will always show you the query that it used, but it may be exactly the same. You may not actually know it's different. The warning will always be there, and I think it'll just show you the act. Basically, it shows you the, the query that it's working with. So you then have to like compare them. Anybody else? No. Nope. Sorry, what's the? Okay, so the things in 5.6 are improvements. Are, one, you can run an explain plan on insert, update, and delete. The optimizer trace is a new command that will give you the full detail of information in JSON format. You can also, ex you can also run an explain plan and give you JSON output. So I've shown you the output and columns of variables, but now it can actually give you JSON output. And actually, the fourth thing uh, is, is that the uh, operations that sometimes require you to execute subqueries, the derived tables, there have been some very good improvements in the time that it takes that. So sometimes you do an explain, you expect the immediate result, but it takes 30 seconds and you wonder why. Um, there have been some improvements there as well. The third one that was really like the explain output can now be written in a JSON output, so you can use other tools to parse that. Yes? When you run an explain, you have subqueries? Yes. Um, uh, the question is, if you're running an explain that has a, a query that has an update in the subquery, I'm not familiar with that syntax, so um, I don't know what the output actually looked like. Maybe we can take that one offline, you can show me one of those, where you're running a select state with an update inside a derived table or something, or a subquery. Okay. I can't say I've seen that, so I won't comment on what the output would look like. Um, it does. Is anyone at MySQL running on the machine? Want to pick it up and try it out? Oh, no. There's a big cloud thing happening that everyone should know be able to how to run something in the cloud. We should be able to fire up their AWS instance. 60 seconds. No? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, sir, if you come up here, I have a, a book that I'll grab out of my bag uh, as a, uh, a, a brave soul for giving an actually reasonably correct answer. Great.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Astris. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Astris, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astrospace systems, including our own SwitchFox-based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astris or SwitchFox-based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astris. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. 
you have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack Management Server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.